This episode of It's the End of the World as We Know It and I Feel Fine was made possible by contributions from slaves like you. Thank you very much. We teach our children what? Honesty and hard work are the keys to success. And my children, my children are not going to go off to some war. They're going to go to Yale. They're going to go to Harvard. And it's going to be the dumb, stupid, white trash kids and the black ghetto kids that are going to... They're going to fight America's senseless wars, and they're going to protect American security and businesses. And it's going to be my business. My business is going to get richer and richer, and my bonuses are going to get bigger and bigger. And it's the same old story. It's the bankers and the owners and the advisors who get rich. And it's the little people who buy their stock that always lose in the end. It's the end of the world as we know it. I feel fine. Slaves and welcome to another edition of It's the End of the World as We Know It and I Feel Fine, the show that supports police officers' right to strike. Solidarity forever. Meanwhile, there's been looting downtown. But right now, Green, what I want to show you is I, 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 I,
That being said, with the sheer number of warning signs pointing to a looming financial meltdown, now might be a good time for peeps to be careful with how they invest their hard-earned ducats. This is a real gold teeth, fully iced out with a yellow diamond we did for one of our good customers. One of the main economic indicators that currently has financial analysts panties in a bunch is the price of oil, which has been steadily dropping for months and is now sitting at around 50 bucks a barrel. While this means that it's a great time to be a douchebag with a Hummer, this is a good town car. It's not a great time to be one of the millions of people living in countries where social programs are funded through oil revenue. This is a serious fucking problem right now in countries like Iran, Venezuela, and Russia, where everyday folks have found themselves caught between the geopolitical brinksmanship of their own political elite and the cynical maneuvering of the Saudi royals who have been flooding the market in a deliberate act of economic warfare that harkens back to their 1973 Western oil embargo. Doesn't this new massive increase in the price of oil mean a change in the world balance of power? between the developing nations like you, the producers, and us, the developed industrialized nations? Yes, it will. And what do you think arises from that? Well, a new type of relationship. You have to adjust yourself to the new circumstances. But things are not all doom and gloom. In a serious case of politics making strange fucking bedfellows... Oh. I just can't resist your intense animal magnetism. The Saudi engineered drop in oil prices has been great news for all of those resisting the motherfucking tar sands. Because of the high cost of refining tar sands bitumen into synthetic crude, oil prices need to be at above 68 bucks a barrel in order to turn a profit. In other words, oil companies exploiting the tar sands are currently producing at a serious fucking loss, which may well put the freeze on proposed expansion projects such as the Keystone XL and Energy East pipelines. While it's in no way an ideal, or even long-term solution, any delays in Tarzan's expansion give peeps fighting this ecocidal mega-project more time to refine their strategies and tactics and to start putting their attack plans into action. Do this for my jewel and my gem. Those are my daughters, I do it for them. I did it before and I do it again. I sacrifice again and again. Everything I haven't owned through them, my legacy lives on. For every day a child is born, a soul is taken, passing on. Sacrifice a sacrifice. Life is like cold and ice. I give my last bag of rice, cause you will not starve the night. You will not die of hunger. All my life put me under, under the jail. Lose the key like George Jackson did for me. Troy Davis, I'm Troy Davis. I say it again and again. He was murdered on death row like many innocent men. When I say innocent, I mean innocent. Never proven too much doubt when they can't take your dignity they're trying to take you out i offer this sacrifice of blood food and rum and need me through to, to all the dead to the ceremonies done jonathan jackson olita lebron and young lord shacha jimenez they all sacrifice their lives for us to take be here present sacrifice. take your sacrifice take your sacrifice because you don't know if it's an afterlife if it's an afterlife take your sacrifice take your sacrifice Cause you don't know if it's an afterlife If it's an afterlife Since 2010, Greece has been ground zero for the global economic meltdown. Unable to pay back its debt to its wealthy neighbors such as France and Germany, the country famously known as the birthplace of democracy has been since transformed into a laboratory for brutal economic shock therapy. <coughs> For years now, public anger has been mounting over declining living standards and the bleak fucking prospects for economic recovery, and on January 25th, the country voted in a new left-wing coalition, Syriza. For Shizu. Our common future in Europe is not the future of austerity, it's the future of democracy, solidarity and cooperation. While leftists worldwide have been treating this victory as the second fucking coming of Hugo Chavez, Anarchists in Greece are skeptical that Syriza's leadership will be able to make good on their promises. To learn more about the situation, I caught up with Antonis Bradis, editor of the Anarchist Autonomous Collective, Occupied London. Hey Antonis, how the fuck are you? I'm very well, thank you. It looks like you're somewhere warm, just just where the fuck are you now? I'm in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and it's really fucking hot. Well, for all of us up north in the cold tundra, fuck you. Anyway. A lot of lefties out there are creaming their shorts because Syriza swept the Greek elections. But you wrote, Syriza won't save you. Just what the fuck do you mean? Well, for a lot of the lefties, it might be good news. And maybe potentially for some of us too. But anarchists, as you know, don't 
anarchists don't participate in elections and anarchists don't expect people to save them. I never do shoot most, most people. But wouldn't a Syriza government open up more space for anarchists and anti-authoritarians to organize in? i.e. less political repression? In that sense, a Syriza government may actually be good news. It's opening up spaces for us in which to, to organize and to become politically uh, more effective. But the point is that we cannot rely on any government, of course, to deliver what we're trying to achieve on its own. Uh, we should utilize this space. Uh, we should demand it in the same way that we were demanding against the previous government, but we should not rely on Syriza to, to do anything on our behalf. In your article you write, it would be wiser to strengthen and build economies and structures of solidarity. Just what the fuck do you mean by economies and structures of solidarity? Well, what I mean is exactly what we're trying to do in Athens uh, at the moment, and it's something that we had started uh, already, of course, before the elections. We've been planning it for just under a year now which is to actually purchase uh, a large building in, in central Athens, actually in Exarchia, and on the same, hopefully on the same street where uh, Alexis was, uh, was assassinated by the police in 2008. That's, that's a building that we targeted. So what we want to do there is create uh, a space for uh, grassroots media and grassroots uh, trade unions, uh, both from within the country and internationally to share the space, to run it together uh, and to organize uh, in common. So it's, it's a big experiment, uh, by, by Greek standards it's unique. Uh, as far as I know also, uh, by many other countries' standards it, it's unique too. And it's something that would make us uh, a space that would be much more immune to, to state repression and would also not rely on, it wouldn't make us rely on the political kind of like balances of every time. So instead of just waiting to see what happens at the level of the government, we ignore that, we bypass it and we organize locally, uh, but very international at the same time. So below and above the level of the nation state, which is our enemy. Do you think that there's gonna be a coup propelled by European banks or governments if Syriza decides to renege on the debt? If you had asked me a few months ago whether there would be, or a few years ago, whether there would be a coup in Greece, I would tell you no fucking way. But then again, if you had asked me a few months ago whether there would be a left-wing government in Greece, I would have told you no fucking way. So it's actually pretty, it's next to impossible to, to, to guess what will happen. If I had to guess, I think they won't do it because they rely on a standard kind of like uh, order, the bourgeois democracy still has like this facade of, uh, of normality that's not willing to, to drop yet. To go so blatant and explicit as to have a coup would cost them in terms of, uh, you know, uh, PR-wise, just public relations, it just looks terrible. So I think they might have to tolerate the new situation and they might just try to fight uh, whatever uh, potential there would be from a Syriza government in different ways. A few years ago, a neo-Nazi political party, Golden Dawn, was making waves. What's the deal with them now that their leadership has been supposedly neutralized? That's a crazy thing that no one is talking about Golden Dawn as if it disappeared as a threat. The truth is that in Sunday's elections they scored just under, maybe they lost about 10% of their electoral uh, power compared to 2012. So, in 2012, I think we got just about 440,000 votes. This time around, it was just under 400,000. It's a small drop, given that, as you say, their the leadership is behind bars. They had a complete media blackout, and they have been completely exposed to the Nazis that they are. What this means is that the people who still voted for them are very openly, uh, honestly committed Nazis or Nazi uh, supporters, whether, whether there's a difference between the two or not, I don't know. But this is extremely uh, alarming, it's dangerous, because it shows that there's a very strong and big core in the Greek society that's actually waiting for any kind of like slip of uh, this radical alternative to the crisis, so to speak, uh, to then try out the other uh, radical alternative, the other uh, end of the spectrum. Many people believe that the economic clusterfuck that Greece is going through now is going to hit the US and Canada in a similar way. How can peace repair for when the shit hits the fan? I'm pretty sure something is going to happen. I'm pretty sure this is, uh, as people say, this kind of mess is uh, totally contagious. It has 
been jumping from one country to the other. Uh, two things, if there's any humble suggestions to come out of the Greek experiences, two things. One of them is organize uh, locally, as grassroots as possible, make sure you create uh, grassroots structures that can, that can uh, defend themselves when the time comes and they can actually live through and bloom during the crisis. And the other one is international, internationally learn from other, from our comrades experiences because there's this, this very bizarre time lag going on about what we experience in what countries, what happened in another country before or what will happen in the future. And since we are a very international bunch, as we should, uh, this is one of our biggest uh, strengths, learn from each other. Thanks, Antonis. And that about that's it for this edition of It's the End of the World as we know it and I feel fine. Even with the economy burning up like cops in Athens, Peep still scrounged up enough cash to help us make this second show of our ninth fucking season happen. So I like to say, if Haristo, too, Francois, Joanna, Shannon, Miguel, Stephen, Christian, Kyle, Jonathan, Edward, Diana, Sarah, Gregory, James, Kevin, Julia, Audrey, Renzo, Thomas, Jeremy, Max, Oliver, Alessandra, Catherine, Dylan, Justina, Emmanuel, Nick, Kirk, Jennifer, Valentin, Jahi, Scott, and Ernesto Baklava. Also, want to let you motherfuckers know that we are looking for volunteers to help us transcribe this fucking show. So if you have some time on your hands, email me, stimulator at submedia.tv. Also, at the time of this writing, rabble-rousing anarchist prisoner, Sean Swain, went on strike because the screws of the prisoner fucking with his ability to communicate with the outside world. To find out how to support him, visit seanswain.org. To send me tips on surviving the economopocalypse. To subscribe to our newsletter and podcast. Or to send me music suggestions, just visit my fucking website, stimulator.tv. Now turn this shit off and go meet your neighbors. Take your sacrifice. Cause you don't know if it's an afterlife. If it's an afterlife. When the revolution comes, black cultural centers will be fought, supplying revolutionaries with food and arms when a revolution comes. Speak not of revolution until you are willing to eat rats to survive.